At issue this week, selling the budget with promises of fairness and affordability. But some measures, like a hike on the capital gains tax, are drawing concern. We raised some additional revenue, asking those at the very top to pay a little bit more. That is what is financing the big investments in housing, in affordability, in economic growth that the federal government is making. How have Canadians responded to the budget plan and how much does the government have to sell it? Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here to break it down tonight on Ad Issue, Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. Althea, let's start with you uh, tonight. Do you, do you, how, let's start with this issue of capital gains because it has become sort of the... Uh, the, the one thing that people are questioning, I think, a little bit, particularly people who have money or people who own businesses. Is this something that the government uh, could be problematic for the government or is this something that they would welcome? Uh, I, I think it can be both things, frankly. Yeah. It yeah. can be problematic in the sense that you already are starting to see uh, opposition mount against it. And rich people tend to have access to loud megaphones to make their voice heard in a way that poor people don't have. Um, so it's natural that you hear more from one side or the institutional voice is more on this side. But there is a concern that it turns into a fight a little bit like the fight on private corporations during the Bill Morneau era of 2017, where you have people who are sympathetic to the greater public, to the middle class, and even to people who are trying, working hard, struggling to join it, um, where it feels a little unfair, like mm. the single mother who is a doctor who uses her private corporation to invest for her pension, for example, or that sure. is, so there are sympathetic people that might emerge that might make the sell of this more complicated uh, than the government intends. But I will say that, you know, listening to question period this week, the only party that seemed to be really keen to talk about the budget was the Bloc Québécois because of all of the federal meddling in provincial jurisdiction. The Conservatives did not seem at all interested in talking mm. about this budget, mm. so you have to see it as a win for the Liberals. The Liberals do want to engage, you could call it class warfare, this discussion about we're taxing the ultra-rich to pay for those who need it, basically the 2015 playbook that did work well for them. There are concerns in caucus. Uh, among MPs who have their supporters are blue liberals or who fundraise using blue liberals, that they're alienating some core supporters. But the government clearly has made the play that they're going after center left voters and that is their ticket to possibly stay in office a bit longer. There is, I think, Andrew, some questions about um, not the ultra-rich, but people, for instance, who own a second residence, uh, cottages would spring to mind, uh, how they might be affected by that capital gains thing. So you can see how, yes, it could could do what the government, I think, wants it to do, but it could also affect people that might get sort of caught up in it, we, we, you know, unintentionally, or, or even if they have a little bit more money. Yeah, I mean, there, I think there are more than a few echoes of the small business fiasco. Well, we'll see whether it turns into that, but including the overconfidence of the government on this. At, on budget day, I think I looked at it and I thought, well, this is probably bad policy, but good politics. Who doesn't like soaking the rich? I've kind of come around to the view that it's actually good policy, but bad politics. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you're moving the tax system more towards neutrality. At, at, yes. at, at two-thirds inclusion rated, you're, you're basically equalizing the tax treatment of capital gains, dividends, and interest, and that's good policy in and of itself. The problem in policy terms, first of all, is if you only do that and you don't do anything else, if you don't do it as part of a broader tax reform, then you are kind of basically raising taxes at a time when that's the last signal the government should be sending. Uh, but in policy terms, it's even worse, I think, from that, or I should, political terms, it's even worse from that standpoint. As we saw, and as the government should have learned from the small business uh, debacle, uh, if you only do one reform of a tax and not of a, of a broader thing where you've got winners and losers and people can sort of see pluses and minuses in it, if you just basically single out one group, mm. uh, then it's very easy for them to say that they, they've been victims of selective justice. And particularly when it's a group that sees itself as being small businesses and plucky entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. And so, as you say, it's not just the people who can declare $250,000 in capital gains in a year who are going to be hit by this. It is people who have second homes, cottages, et cetera, and it's people who have corporations. Uh, and they are people like doctors and lawyers. I had a woman stop me at lunch today to complain bitterly about this. I can't remember that happening after any previous budget. So they may find this is going to, I mean, they poked the hornet's nest again. We'll see. Yeah, it, it could also, if it was framed properly, Chantel, be, uh, you know, said that it is about fairness, actually bringing fairness to the taxation system. I, I don't know that it's 
that it's unfolding that way right now, but give, give me your thoughts on how they're managing this particular issue. It's always dangerous uh, when we do political analysis to confuse noise for uh, a large audience. And for mm -hmm. sure, the people who are affected by this uh, command attention and the media in a way that the people who are not do not. Yes. I'm not convinced that people who are struggling to pay a mortgage on the first home or who are trying to buy a first home or find an apartment are going to have a lot of sympathy for uh, cottage owners who worry <laughs> that their $700,000 profit might be taxed more or closer to what their actual income is taxed which okay. is what happens to people who do not have that uh, cottage. So I think the saving grace for the liberals on this is that the conservatives understand the perils of making this their, their choice battleground on this budget, yeah. Yeah. that they will be exposed as fighting for people. It's easy to write a story about the single mother who is using uh, et cetera, for a pension. It's easy also to show that they are defending someone with a $2 million uh, gain on a cottage on a nice lake in Ontario. Yeah. And then you look like you're fighting for people who actually have more than a home. Yeah. It may be bad politics, but I noticed that today the Quebec government announced that it would match the federal move uh, and and tax at the same level. So I'm yeah. guessing that uh, the revenues are worth more than the, the bad optics in the eye of other governments. We'll see. Yeah, Andrew, you want this, to get in there? Yeah. All I would say is that the same arguments could have been made about the small business tax changes, that they were basically, you know, they were perfectly reasonable changes. They were basically just slightly limiting the ability of people to turn themselves into corporations for tax reasons. So you wouldn't have thought it would cause the government a great deal of problem, and I doubt that uh, the average person was terribly sympathetic. But the ability of a very determined group that sees itself as victims and, and, and is sincerely convinced that it's been terribly treated, the ability of that government to make a lot of trouble for a government, of that group to make a lot of trouble for a government and occupy space that the government would, would like to be devoted to other questions, uh, I think should not be discounted. Chantal, then I'll and, yeah. and that kind of tells you probably why the Liberals spent three weeks detailing their budget before presenting the budget, because mm -hmm. right. ever since they did present the budget, that is basically all you've heard about. Uh, you didn't hear about the deficit that's higher because it's not, yeah. so, so that captured a lot of the attention. But I'm not sure that the small business controversy cost the Liberals a lot of vote back then. It did, it did take a lot of attention away from other things they might have wanted, but I'm not sure that it sank them in the polls. Right, but when you're 20 points behind the polls, you need every good week of media coverage and, and you know, contra controversy-free coverage you can. So sure. anything that occupies that is going to hurt them. Althea. Well, it's still better than raising the GST two points to get the same income. <laughs> Althea, that's true. Althea. That's true. Choices. That's true. Althea. I, I think the difference between the example of 2017 and now is that now we have something to compare it against in the sense that in 2017, the changes to um, private corporations were kind of done in a vacuum, like the yes. government is thinking about doing this. And now the government is saying, we're doing this to pay for housing for millennials and yeah. Generation Z. Yeah. And I yeah. think that these individuals who really feel like the system is unfair, like that they're not gonna have as great a life as their parents had, will feel that, it's too early obviously, it's only been two days to see what the polling yeah. is, but their deficit with millennials and Generation Z is so large that you have to think that they have thought this through yeah. and this is what they're saying. So all these people might complain and they might complain really loudly, but they're the ones who are preventing you from having a home, for being able to afford your rent. Like yeah. I think that changes the calculation and the yeah. gamble for the government. Uh, uh, Andrew doesn't believe they've thought it through. I, I'm just, the record. That was, uh, that was I'm just not sure we have to accept that. <laughs> That's fine. Yes, but That's uh, fine. It, will help, it will help the government if the people complaining are all baby boomers. Uh, or, or all people who have a lot of money. Pierre Poiliev is criticizing the budget, but when the opposition leader sat down with Radio-Canada's Patrice Roy, he would not commit to what government programs he would keep and what he would get rid of. Est-ce que vous gardez ou pas, là? Assurance dentaire, gardez-vous ça? Ça n'existe pas. C'est fini. Ça n'existe pas. On verra ce qui va 
faire avec ça, M. Trudeau. On a une promesse. On a des promesses sur toutes sortes de programmes. Does the Conservative leader need to be saying more? Does his critique of the budget resonate for Canadians? Let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew and Althea. Um, Chantal, I, I, I thought this interview was interesting and revealing because I thought the questions were uh, fair, they were substantive, there was an attempt to get real answers from Mr. Poiliev on a series of different policy issues. Um, it, I'll let you evaluate his answers though. What, what did you make of, of how he fared there? I thought that uh, his answers on uh, the, the dental plan or pharmacare were actually astute answers in the sense that, uh, and, and they do not answer the question fully, but in the sense sure. that these are plans that the government has that have yet to see the light of day. I believe oh. dental care is going to happen. Yes. Uh, and I didn't hear Mr. Poiliev saying that if it did happen, he would trash it. But he is right in saying that these are works in progress. And before you decide you're going to trash or eliminate something, you should at least know that it exists. Sure. And on pharmacare, I have strong doubt. Al Althea had a very strong reaction, so we'll go to her next. <laughs> Well, it's not true. I mean, he said clearly during that interview that yeah. not a single child's teeth had been cleaned through the government's program, which is actually just not true. So the program, no, as it was originally... No, he didn't say a child's teeth. He said the teeth. No teeth. teeth. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. no teeth. Yeah. Well, so according to the government's own website, 436,860 children have used this program. Now, it isn't the, the fully fleshed out version of the program that's supposed to roll out in January, but the interim measures that mm. were agreed upon with the NDP that kicked in in December 2022 um, have materialized. Lots of parents have received money, more than 400 million. Yeah. So <laughs> you can't say, I would hope that a politician can't go on, the, on, on national TV and just lie like that, like that. That's not fair to the audience. You, we should be arguing about facts. We should not be making up facts so we can argue about things that are not accurate. I, I, I find that very troubling. Uh, uh, he, uh, was, he, was giving, he was giving that interview in Quebec where kids were covered before the federal that's, initiative. That's fair. Okay, that's so that's for fair. For the record. Uh, Andrew, you, you, you watched it too. Let me get your impression of just about how, like, what he's trying to do in terms of how he's criticizing the budget and position himself. Yeah. Well, we should say, first of all, there was a worse lie in there, which was uh, claiming that, uh, that the, the bill that brings in not Pharmacare, but some timid beginnings of it, uh, would mean that you'd lose your private uh, drug insurance. Now, that is potentially true if they were ever to go to um, um, universal, you know, universal um, single payer. Single payer is a polite way of saying government monopoly. So he'd be on firmer ground. But it, as it stands, that's precisely why the Liberals haven't gone there, is they know it's, that's not a political winner. And it certainly is bad policy, in my view, as well. Uh, that was look, on another interview today. Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry, yeah. But yeah, look, he, 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 he absolutely at some point has to talk about what he'd cut. I think he would, he would like to see, see him talk about what he would cut to try to bring spending back in line with revenues and, and reduce the deficit. Uh, whether he will or not, I don't know. On the day after the budget, I'm not sure he's necessarily obliged to go into detail about his spending plans. I think an opposition leader on the day of a budget or the day after a budget is entitled to focus his fire on the government of the day and the proposals sure. that it has put forward, sure. uh, which do indeed involve rampant uh, increases in spending. Uh, there's no necessity to be raising taxes to finance even the programs the government is putting forward because somewhere surely to God in a $500 billion uh, budget, you can find the savings to finance those housing programs. So, he, you know, he's entitled to rain his fire on the government at that point, but I think at some point he does have to, to start to talk about what he would do and what he would cut. Chantal? Yeah. Uh, I I understand the, the part about lying. Is Quebec lieutenant was on radio saying the federal government spends twenty billion, twenty one billion dollars on consulting fees. Actually, the figure is in the millions and not the billions. But uh, but the critique of the budget is one thing. I don't think that uh, Pierre Poilievre needs to say that he's going to be killing programs that have yet to take off. Uh, and at this point, he is right when he says the pharmacare program is just a word uh, on a press release. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually thought it, there was, it was quite revealing for what he chose to say and what he decided not to say. Yes. So we yes. don't yes. have him on 
where he what he would do on pharmacare or what he would do on dental care or even what he would do on capital gains because the anchor kind of tried to direct him in a way, but he didn't really agree with the anchor. It wasn't really clear, and then that clip was over. So we don't really know what he would do on capital gains. I think there is a lot on the Tory side of let's wait and see what's entrenched, what we could get rid of without paying a political price, and then we'll decide. But he has been very clear. Um, he does want to reduce the size of the deficit uh, and eventually the debt. He has been very honest about what that horizon could mean, which is, I don't know, uh, which I appreciate. I like it when politicians tell you what they know and what they don't know. Um, he has talked about, you know, reducing spending in order to enact new spending. His housing plan actually in some ways, is quite similar to the Liberals' new yeah. housing plan. It does feel like the Liberals stole a few pages off the Pierre Poilievre playbook when it came to zoning around public transit, for example, the way they would deal with municipalities. So there is some overlap. It was, I like it when politicians talk to the media, and I do think that the audience was well served. They did learn something. I yeah. just wish we were a bit more factual yeah. when we talked yeah. about this. Uh, I, yeah. think, I don't think he has to oppose the capital gains increase. In fact, I think he'd be smart not to. I think he'd yeah. be smarter to talk about what's the broader tax reform agenda? How can we get tax rates down rather than why should we have a special preference for capital gains? That's both smart from conservative tax policy perspective, but I think it's also smart politically. Well, the capital he has gains said he will seem, reduce yeah. income tax. He has said that. Yeah. yeah, the capital gains thing did seem like a bit of a trap for him uh, that the Liberals had set there too, Chantal. And he didn't go there and it yeah. was noticeable. And I think that's the wise thing to do because uh, what the, the Liberals really, really want is for the Conservatives to engage on that field. I think they're not going to get that battle. Pushback over the carbon tax continues, this time from the Liberal Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, who feels targeted by the Prime Minister. I think, you know, on the carbon tax in particular, um, uh, the Prime Minister has tried to bait me at times with, uh, with uh, certain ad hominems and name-calling almost, but look, we have a very different opinion on the carbon tax. What's to be made of this latest battle between Ottawa and Newfoundland and Labrador? What does it say about the current state of the Federation? Let's bring everyone back. Chantel, Andrew, Althea. Andrew, why don't you start us off? I mean, this is, to me, this is fascinating because Andrew Fury was a close ally of Trudeau's, was very useful to Trudeau. I, I get why publicly he has to say these things, but I, I just don't know, like, what is the state of the relationship at this stage if this is the back and forth between them? Yeah, I mean, the, well, the ad hominem that he accuses the Prime Minister of were, I, I, as I recall, he rightly pointed out that the pr Premier's under some political pressure and was looking yes. for a way to demagogue this issue, which is yeah. just true. <laughs> uh, and look, he just suffered a rather stinging by-election defeat in a riding that, if I recall correctly, they won going away in the general election yeah so he's you know how much of it how much of a part uh, carbon taxing uh, played in that I don't know I suspect it wasn't that large but it's certainly convenient for the premier to say oh it's because of that and uh, woe is me I've been put upon by the by the prime minister so this is uh, politics as usual I would yeah say. I mean maybe he called the prime minister before and said I'm gonna use you as a straw man hope that's okay no. I don't know Chantel <laughs> I don't think the relationship is uh, that warm at this point. Uh, yes. Premier Fury has been front and center in the Premier's calls for uh, a pause on the carbon tax. He wrote letters. He participated in the calls for a First Minister's meeting yeah. almost from the outset, which gave a lot of momentum to the issue because it allowed the opposition to say even the Liberal Premier of yeah. Newfoundland, mm -hmm. Labrador, mm -hmm. is calling for this. So, no, I, I don't think that they're um, sharing notes at night or, over what they do, <laughs> but it did bring back memories, and let me age myself here. Please do. I remember covering Ontario at the tail end of the Pierre Trudeau era, mm -hmm. and one night when David Peterson, then Liberal leader, but not Premier of Ontario, lost a by-election in a seat that the Liberals could have won. I remember him saying, I am not going to win a single by-election or vote until I get that Trudeau albatross off my neck. <laughs> and that is what happens at the tail end of, yeah. of, of usually a, a reign federally versus provincial wings. So I, I looked at Premier Furry and I saw a young David Peterson. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Althea, how, how did you read those comments? Rinse and repeat. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of Liberal premiers in Atlantic Canada are feeling um, under pressure 
uh, liberal leaders because liberal leaders, of the yeah. carbon tax. And the conservatives have done a really good job of tying basically provincial liberals to federal liberals. And in the minds of many, probably most people who don't actually watch the show, um, <laughs> There are a lot of people who don't know the difference between different levels of government and different political parties. And for them, a liberal is a liberal. And if the liberals are responsible for the carbon tax, then you must also be sure, responsible sure. for yeah. the carbon tax. Yeah. Um, so there is, you know, an uphill uh, battle for some uh, leaders to overcome. Uh, for the premier of a province who actually thinks that this is not the best policy, um, it's also a useful foe to fight against, uh, just like it is for conservative premiers in other provinces. Yeah. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, though, and this is something liberals have just started to mention. If you don't like it, you can also develop your own plan like yeah. British Columbia yeah. and Quebec. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't seem to really be part of the discussion because it's not convenient for any of the current premiers who want to fight with Ottawa to have a talk about how they could not charge a consumer price on carbon it, in it, their own province. It's also, or, or, it's also Andrew, possible. Andrew Chantal, last word. Yeah. It's also possible that what's dragging them down is not the carbon tax, but Pierre, uh, Justin Trudeau's own personal unpopularity. Yep. In which case, uh, yeah, yeah. in which case, the premier was doing him a favor by saying it's about the carbon price rather than about him. <laughs> Chantal, last word to you. Okay. Or uh, as for the alternative plans uh, to the federal carbon pricing. As Premier uh, Mo in Saskatchewan put it, they looked at alternatives and all of them were more costly. Yeah, yeah, which as Andrew has told us before is indeed the point of the thing. Um, yeah, all right, thank you all uh, for a good week. Appreciate the conversation. We'll see you next week.